Hello, and welcome to episode 59 of the Arena Regulars podcast. I'm Zach. And I'm Jeff. And we're your source for weekly drunken Magic the Gathering arena content. Yeah, basically we're just regular dudes drinking irregular beers and talking about magic, and in particular, Magic the Gathering arena. Yeah, and this week we thought it would be fun to go back to a very old block to get ready for a new set that's coming out. So we are reviewing we're not reviewing we're kind of reviewing kamigawa block um originally so yeah this will be a fun little history lesson for anyone who didn't get to play during that time uh which is sad for you but also kind of good for you probably because (laughs) yeah i think most people probably won't have played that's a long time ago now zach we're aging ourselves a bit here yeah it was um but that's fine hey uh who cares about that um anyway we'll get into that in a minute but first each week we both bring a beer we drink our own then drink each other's rate them on a scale of bronze to mythic and choose the best for last so with that what is on tap for this episode um we're gonna change things up a little bit i know you're used to a very specific way that we forget forget everything you just said yeah um it still matters but um (laughs) now we're we're changing it up and we're going to drink the same beers at the same time so that we have the same beer experience. We've been doing this for the last couple episodes and we're like, you know what? We should change things up a little bit. I think it's, Maybe it's just better. I think it's time, you know? I think it's time for a change. That's what I had in mind when I bought the wrong number of beers in Hamilton was to try to get us on the right course here for um, <laughs> yeah. our system. Yeah. You were just like, oh, you didn't want to really bring it up. It's kind of awkward to be like, hey, can we just like change the whole structure of the show? <laughs> I'll yeah. just accidentally get the wrong number of yours. <laughs> See, you get it. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so this week, we are actually doing a tap takeover, which we haven't done in a while. Actually, no, we recently did one. <laughs> Never yeah, mind. We've we been did doing last few weeks. <laughs> Forget <laughs> everything I just said. Um <laughs> Sorry, so we are doing a tap takeover of uh, Shacklands Brewing Company, which is out here in Ontario. And um, the beer that I brought from them is their special Belgian ale. So most of their stuff is Belgian focused, but this is their special one. Uh, It is 5% in the can. That's exciting. Kind of has like a, kind of looks like, I don't know, mirror-ish. Is it a mirror? Yeah. Some sort of wall hanging thing. It, it reminds me of like one of those old timey bar kind of signs. I guess. You know what it looks like? It looks like our logo is what it looks like. Yeah, sort it, of. <laughs> it looks like <laughs> that's what it's it. making me think of. Yeah. Uh, it looks just like that. Um, but anyway, I am excited to be drinking this one right here, Jeff. I mean, you've had a couple sips already. How are you? It's uh, interesting. I'll have to. I'll have to okay. feel it out a bit more to be sure. All right. Well, first we have some magic news. The Arena Decathlon Finals with this weekend. It is in the books, and uh, it was awesome. Jeff. Yeah, you feel... played in it, right? I did. I did. I, I feel bad that you didn't get to partake because um, I partook a lot, mu- much more than I should have. It was a lot. <laughs> um yeah i mean you but, couldn't even donate one entry to me huh? <laughs> i i but you know i needed all of them because it took me three tries to finally cash it and i went seven and one in my third try getting the w so feels good i'm really happy with that and now my account is just fucking stacked because i forgot that you just get three draft tokens if you go three and three so i have nine draft tokens plus the one that was discounted on the day my account is just like... Holy shit, really? So now I have 10 draft tokens waiting for Neon Destiny, and I'm getting all the cards from the set. So I'm like, okay, well... <laughs> yeah, one of each card. Man, that's that's crazy. You're going to have, like, everything you want out of Neon Dynasty pretty quickly. Yeah, so I'm really crossing my fingers that the set is good, because uh, I'm going to have all the cards, apparently. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's, uh, if it's predecessors or any indication, it's going to be an absolute... Well, it's going to be an absolute something. <laughs> um but with the uh the finals there's a lot of talk on twitter which was great but the best thing that was going on was some arena etiquette now we haven't had arena etiquette in a while but the way that the finals worked is that if you get seven wins on one of your entries if it's like the first one after your fifth win 
Six and seven doesn't really matter because you get like an avatar and then something you can't get multiples of. So what was happening is that people would spike their first run and then do their other two entries and play up to five wins and then just give away their other games. They wouldn't drop. They would just like go into a match and give a free win and say good game and then just concede the match. Um, which I thought was really sportsman, uh, like good good sportsmanship. I really enjoyed that. Somebody gave yeah. that gave or me if you a win. Like aren't even going to use your extra entry. Just jump in and concede three times or whatever. Exactly. Just to be like, hey, just handing out free wins. Um, I guess you would so. have to do the cube draft though. You would have to do the cube draft, but that's kind of fun. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, my second run, somebody gave me a free win, which was really nice. Um, it didn't. It helped me a little bit, but. Uh, just get one yeah, extra got you a draft token or something. Yeah. So, uh, so that was good. But anyway, just, I liked the community coming together and being like, Hey, try to give out some free wins if you can. And people were like, okay. And then they just did. So, uh, love, love to see that. But Jeff, we have something coming up this weekend. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah. So this weekend, uh, I guess the 15th, 16th would be it is the arena open. I'm sure you all know about this. It's all over the place. Oh, no, wait. Like, all arena opens, you never know until it's, like, the next day. Um, And it's going to be Alchemy. So this will be, I guess, the first real chance to kind of play competitive Alchemy, as far as I know. Yeah, that's... I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And it's funny because, once again, the only way I knew this was happening is because Brad Nelson tweeted about it on Twitter. It's just... how. (laughs) We also had some news this week on Twitter. This was announced. Uh, Watsi said that um, they will not be rebalancing or changing any alchemy cards until the next tournament, which from that post was three weeks away. It's the qualifier weekend, like I think the 22nd and the 23rd of this month. Um, there's a lot of talk about it and how people are frustrated. And they're like, well, if you have this digital only format, why aren't you changing cards all the time? And I don't know why Watsi didn't just say, because the arena open is next weekend. That's why. They right. could literally have said that. Everything would have been squashed. And everyone's like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. One week to get ready for the Arena Open isn't enough time for most people. So we won't. Instead, they were just silent and everyone was just shitting on them. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, well. Um, I feel like at a certain point, it's on us to just guess that there's an Arena Open. Because they're not going to tell us about them. And they're going to make decisions based on them. So... <laughs> Next time, I'm, I'm going to be, like, sniffing for anything odd they do and be like, see if I can figure out when the arena opens up. Oh, it's got to be... Either it's an arena open or there's a new format. That's basically what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, anyway, that is what's happening in Magic. But let's talk about what happened in Magic back in the year 2004. Champions of Kamigawa came out on the scene uh jeff do you want to give us a little bit of a history of kamigawa just kind of where it fits into the magic world and what it is yeah so the kamigawa block came right after the mirrodin block so mirrodin block for those who don't know that was all that was like an artifact matters set and it introduced like a lot of new stuff but mainly the big thing that mirrodin introduced was equipment but the big problem with mirrodin block was that it was messed up in terms of power level like every deck that was doing anything at the time was pretty much affinity there was like just a different type of the same deck and so what they i think like i don't know if they would have been designing this block well enough in advance or if this just kind of took some last minute nerfs or something but the power level of this block seems to have maybe been changed late in the process because that's the only way I can figure out how to explain (laughs) the final product. Um, But in terms of theme, it's like a Japanese mythology theme. And so because of that, it's all about legends and myths. And so I think it's one of the first sets since legends to have focus on legendary creatures as a theme. I think you're definitely right because as we go through some of the cards... The power discrepancies tend to be in the numbers that are on the cards, not necessarily what they do. Um, and you're like, oh, this was a quick right, fix to be like... a few exceptions. Yeah, with a few exceptions. But a lot of it will be like, oh, maybe we'll just make this thing cost more. We'll make this thing cost less. All those kinds of things. Um, similar yeah. to... Uh, so it, it may have left the block in just a really strange place. Like they're panicking because they... I think 
Mirrodin might have been the first time they ever had to ban cards in Standard, or or they hadn't had to do it for a very long time. I don't know if they had to do it since Urza's block. <laughs> since the previous artifact themes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, Jeff has already pointed out that he thinks that there's going to be some busted stuff in the Brothers War. So um, we are coming, we're having another kind of, hey, Kamigawa is really close to maybe an artifact set. So we'll see how that goes. This time it comes first. So uh, there's some cards I do want to point out that they, you know, maybe we'll see a reprint or spiritual reprint of if they've learned their lesson. yeah. Absolutely. Um, before we get right into anything, Jeff, what were you doing in October of 2004? Do you know <laughs> off the top of your head? Uh, off the top of my head. So I would have been in middle school. Yes. Uh, I think I remember that I played Mirrodin. Like I went, I was, there's a local card shop near my middle school that I used to play for Mirrodin. And so I remember going to a draft for either this set. Oh, no, it must have been Betrayers because I played against uh, a card that we'll mention later, but one of the best equipments of all time, twice in that same draft <laughs> and got really cheesed. <laughs> and then I, I decided not to play any more drafts for a while. I decided I hate this block and left. Um, but I was definitely like, you know, through when I was that young, my interest in magic kind of hit peaks and valleys for sure it ebbed and flowed mm -hmm. uh, and so this was Mirrodin block was kind of a peak and then Kamigawa block was actually a bit of a valley for me it's when I played less than I that I played in Mirrodin I don't think you're the only person to have that happen I think a <laughs> lot of people uh had a very similar experience to that um in October 2004 I was in the seventh grade uh and I was playing this as well at my FNMs and uh, things and doing very poorly and thinking a lot of these cards were a lot more fun than the artifacts because uh, I didn't care for artifacts and I think it's primarily the border change and they were silver, which made me hate them. Ooh, I did not like that. The border change in Mirrodin, you know, it maybe it was a delayed reaction for me. <laughs> but, uh... Mine was once, once I started to see them that it's not just a Mirrodin thing, it's also in this. I was like, oh, yeah, uh, mine was very immediate and visceral. And so I was finally happy to be playing other colors um, again. And uh, so happy with that. But but like I didn't even like the the way the colored cards looked like I just didn't oh. like that the, the new borders had taken over. No, absolutely. And I was kind of hoping that this set would bring us back. It was going to be a fun, like, oh, the cool Mirrodin world is like this. And then we go to this ancient Japan place and we go back to the Yeah, I was hoping for that too. And then these Didn't were happen. A bummer when I saw that it's the same border. But. Did not happen. But as far as the story goes, I don't know a ton about the story of Kamigawa and I'm excited to learn coming up in the next few weeks. Hint, hint. But... Basically, the story revolves around a war between the humans who have regular magic and the spirits that use arcane magic. Now, Jeff, what is arcane magic? And how does it relate to everything we're going to talk about this episode? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, as far as what it is, no idea. But mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's like a, would you call this a super type? Or is this just a super type like instant? So it's, a, it's just a It's type. a subtype. Gotcha. All right, so it's a subtype of instants and sorceries, um, and mechanically, it doesn't do anything on its own. Some some <laughs> spells are just labeled arcane, uh, and that's how you know that they have that subtype. I guess sort of like a creature subtype. Some of them, with, like on the actual card, it doesn't matter that it's a, a soldier or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. there. Um, but there's a mechanic in the set called Splice onto Arcane, which is basically on other arcane spells, and you can pay a uh, splice onto arcane cost to, well, exactly like it sounds, splice it onto an arcane. So you can cast an arcane spell and then add this effect to that one by revealing it from your hand and paying its cost. So I guess it's kind of trying to represent this idea that the arcane spirit magic can, like, combo up. You could take two different spells and, like, make them into a combo spell. Um, which I, seems really cool in theory. It does. Um, it does sound really cool in theory. Um, but in practice... Like, mix and matching spells to make your own spell is a cool idea. Um, yeah. 
Um, it's not really how these things played, though. No. So um, most of the time, the splice and arcane was like the same mana cost or um, usually more than it would be uh, if you just played it outright. Uh, the problem with it is, is that when you're playing the cards, it has to splice first on an arcane spell, which is totally fine. That makes sense. It's all the spirits work together. And then the other spells are like human spells, I guess. So, sure. Uh, but, like, having to focus so intensely on this one specific type of spell to then, you don't really get a cost reduction, which is usually what you want. Um, you get to play something over and over again, but it's, you still have to pay so much into it. It just never, it just doesn't, it's kind of clunky. It doesn't really get there. Um, right. And part of it is something we'll talk about in a little bit. So it was it feels like arcane was or splice on the arcane was like a seed for an ability that comes up in a couple sets. Um, that's supposed to be like, Hey, mm -hmm. keeping spells in your hand is really good, which we'll get to in a little bit. But, uh, I mean, the other thing about it was that the idea sounds so super cool. I could take two different arcane spells and like merge them to make one super spell of, of my own creation. But then because you had to splice onto arcane, and because not every arcane spell had splice on the arcane, the number of options you found yourself with actually went down dramatically. It'd be like, oh, there are like two red splice on the arcane cards, and one of them is garbage, and then now I have to splice that onto a red arcane spell. Like, you don't have to mechanically, but you're tending to play red cards together, obviously. Um, that in the end it was it didn't feel that cool because there was a limited number of like combos that you were really pulling off ever. Yeah. So the idea of like making my own spells by combining any two turned into you can combine these two spells if you want to. Yeah. Uh, and then like a lot of it was, oh, I really want a very cheap arcane spell to be able to splice a bunch of stuff onto or splice one thing and keep it or whatever. And mm -hmm. for the most part, it's kind of like there's one card. It's Reach Through Mists, which is a single blue for an instant that just says draw a card, which is Jeff's favorite card. Mm -hmm. Jeff loves uh, cantrips. I love cards like that, as, as everyone knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you really want this Those Reach Through Mists. cards that don't actually do anything. So instead of playing a card and then it having draw a card on it, basically you're saying you're playing a card that says draw a card and then you add other abilities to it to make it actually good. Uh, <laughs> so... Right. Um, <laughs> Right, yeah. and so that was the optimization problem. It's like find the good ar splice onto arcane and then find the cheapest arcane spell you can. Yeah. Uh, and so it ends up just not playing in the cool way that it kind of reads like at first. Exactly. Uh, and of course, the other problem is that the card that you splice stays in your hand. So it's literally just you casting the same spell over and over all game because the other arcane spell is literally only there as a vessel to cast this one. And so you're just, like, shocking their face. You know, our example is Glacial Ray, which is a shock with Splice Under. It costs two, one and a red, but it has Splice Under Arcane for one and a red. Like, you would lose games to just somebody has two of these in their hand, and then every time they draw an Arcane spell, they dome you for four, and then they mm -hmm. pass. And it's just, can you beat my four damage a turn clock or whatever? <laughs> four damage times the number of Arcane spells I hit. Yeah, um, which is pretty boring like as far as like yeah it's just it's just not fun to ha re maybe it's fun ish for that to happen once but that became like a part of the metagame kind of thing like this is just what's happening with arcane spells i'm trying to cast the same spell all game <laughs> yeah um so yeah as far as that whole thing um there are also other cards that care about you casting spirits and arcane stuff, um, which is sure. kind of yeah. fine that goes with the arcane spells, but uh, overall, um, didn't love it. I was wondering, you know, maybe if, it, if every spell, instant and sorcery, if every instant and sorcery had arcane, would I like splice and arcane better so that I didn't have to specifically find these arcane ones every instant and sorcery was arcane which meant it was more of a spells matter kind of strategy and not a specific spells matter strategy um and i think even with that no i don't know if i like it that much <laughs> you might like it better i don't know if yeah. you like it <laughs> yeah i think that's what it is uh so we'll see uh once again as we kind of go through these 
Um, we'll we'll kind of talk about whether we want it to be in Neon Destiny, Destiny, Neon Dynasty or not. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that is they're going to... in Neon's Destiny? Yeah, is it in... Oh, there we go. Uh, <laughs> what is in Neon's <laughs> Destiny? Um, and I don't know if this is going to be in it. I think, I think Arcane and Spice I and can't Arcane. imagine. No. I can't imagine they do this. And that's going to be kind of, just by the way, a default answer for most of the mechanics because... Um, they have a theme of being unnecessarily complicated, kind of. Yeah, like <laughs> this next all one. Mechanics in this block. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the next mechanic we're going to talk about is soul shift, which is specifically around spirits. So both arcane and spirits kind of go hand in hand, and soul shift is an ability that's on a creature. So it's going to be soul shift and a number, and the number is always one less than the mana value of that creature. And what it says is, when this is put into a graveyard from play, you may return target spirit card with converted mana cost X, whatever the soul shift thing is, or less from your graveyard and put it into your hand. So the um, kind of example that we're going to use is Scuttling Death, which is four and a black for a four, two spirit. Already not loving that. Um, And it just has an ability. You can sacrifice it and target creature gets minus one, minus one until in turn. But then it soul shifts for four. So you can go get a different spirit that costs four. And then so you kind of start, you have a bunch of creatures that gets you one for one everything. And then you have a big one that dies that puts them back in your hand and you get to replay all these spirits. Right. The idea is you play like your one drop, two drop, three drop, four drop, five drop spirit. And then after they've all died, you reverse your way back down the chain. But you know, (laughs) they have to be able to do stuff. When they come into play, or they need relevant. Well, this can ATVs. give something minus one, minus one. I mean, this one's nice so. because at least it sacrifices itself, so you can kind of go get something when you need it. If you know you have to get it, you don't have to try to find a way to make it. Don't just sit in like a five mana raise dead plus give something minus one, minus one. Then but yeah, like this is cool. a five mana like conditional raise dead, it has to be a spirit with CMC or a mana value four or less. It's just not. It's not awesome like there are some things that care about sacrificing stuff throughout the block specifically spirits like oh i think there's one in betrayers that's like sacrifice three spirits and you tutor up a spirit to the battlefield or something um so maybe that's nice because you can stack your soul shift triggers but really it's not um the thing the thing i don't it sucks because you have to replay them (laughs) right it goes back to your hand it's just so slow but then they all suck so much it's like how powerful did you guys think this ability was like apparently they thought it was really good i mean sure it's right. like card advantage i guess but you have to it's once again an ability that puts a card into your hand just so you have a card in your hand <laughs> you know right that's what it feels like like oh when this dies you get to draw a card from your graveyard and then it, it'll be good because you have it in your hand you don't want to play it again because it sucks <laughs> like come on yeah and we should let you know our listeners know who weren't playing around this time that cards were in general a lot worse at this time. True, than, okay. especially creatures were just like less good than they are now. This card still sucked. You were still not interested in a five mana four two. No, that sacks to give something minus one minus. Like that's still really bad even for two thousand and four. <sighs> it's so bad. There's a lot of bad stuff. Um, <laughs> This is the, the, the thing I don't get is why does every creature like they made soul shift a mechanic that has a number following it. Mm-hmm. And then every single one, that number is always mana value minus one. Mm-hmm. So couldn't that have just been encoded into the soul shift? Like this has soul shift, which means return something with mana value less than this to the instead of writing <laughs> mana value minus return? one or less. Yeah, I wonder... Uh, well, instead of having the number. If you're going to have the number, you should have stuff with different soul shift numbers that's not always just one less than its mana value. Why can't I push this a little harder and give it soul shift three, even though it has mana value five? Oh, true. Okay, so, so like, make the soul shift worse, but make the creature better? That made, I mean, I would like that a lot more. Um, it gives them more flexibility than always having the soul shift have to be one less than the CMC. You're right. You're right. They built it in so that they could make it more interesting, and then they just didn't. They just, they just never did. And they didn't <laughs> use that at all. They didn't use it at all. Oh, God. 
Um, I definitely wanted this to work as a kid. I thought the chain was so cool, like the reverse chain. Again, that's the uh, theme, man. Like all the ideas are really cool in theory. And then the way they were executed or how they worked in practice is just not cool. <laughs> yeah, it is. There is a reason. So this block is beloved by commander players specifically. Um, mm -hmm. And there's two possible main reasons. One is that it does talk a lot about multiple players for some reason. I don't know why there wasn't really a, I guess there was kitchen table and people would just play for whatever, whoever's around magic. Um, so there's, there's some things like that. But I think the other thing is that the flavor is really strong with these cards and the abilities sound so awesome. Um, exactly. They just don't end up working out that way. But this next one is something that sounds really cool, but ends up, you know. Well, let's just get yeah. into it. Jeff, well, Jeff, what is it? All right. So up next, we got Bushido. Uh, my example here will be Konda, Lord of Iganjo. Five white, white for a 3-3 three, three legendary creature, human samurai with oh. vigilance. Bushido, five, and it's indestructible. Now, Fuck. Bushido means so it's it has a number in this case it's five when it blocks or becomes blocked it gets plus five plus five until end of turn so these samurais are awesome badasses that anything that tries to fight them is surprised at how powerful they are basically you look at them you're like oh that's just some old dude and then you get into you actually start fighting him and he's whooping your ass because he's suddenly looked like a three three but actually was an eight eight when you tried to to rumble with him. Which, you know, he's an old man. Uh, makes sense that mm -hmm. you wouldn't expect him to be as strong as he is. Um, I don't like my seven drops dying to lightning bolt, <laughs> but... Um... <laughs> well, it's indestructible. <laughs> oh, you're right. You're right. Sorry. It is indestructible. Uh, that's my bad. That's my why problem. they threw that on, probably. <laughs> but uh, it is the last ability. Too much in play testing. Yeah, they're like... <laughs> but, but that applies to other Bushido cards, right? You'd have like a five drop that is a 2-2 two -two with Bushido 3 or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, all right, shock your five drop. Like, well, that feels so bad. <laughs> it feels horrible. Um, yeah. And the, the big problem, the biggest problem, and a lot of things with this, <laughs> specifically this ability, is like it incentivizes you to never, ever block. Don't block. Why would you block? Right. You know? You just don't get into combat with this thing, basically. Because if because, you just take the damage, it's only three. Yeah. And there's a lot of ones like, um, let's say there's Battle Mad Ronin, which is one in a red for a 1-1 one, one that has Bajito 2, which seems sweet. Okay, sick. All right, my two drops. It's a 1-1, one, one, but if it fights, it's a 3-3. Three, three. That's great. Um, but then right. they just never block. Then they just, you're attacking I would for never block it. Yeah. You never, ever block. And... And then it's like, do I leave it back on defense? You know, because at least this thing has vigilance, you know, the conda. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to attack into it as well. But when it's, yeah, the 1-1, one, one, <laughs> it's just like, all right, I take one. And now you can either, like, you get your choice between a 1-1 one, one or a 3-3 three, three defender. And neither are something I'm interested in. It's, it's not... Um... Not awesome. It, it, it's just such a bummer because, like, it's, it, it's really similar to flanking. So flanking is the ability from all the way back, which is basically, like, if you block it, your creature that blocked gets minus one, minus one. Or uh, I don't, They weren't numbers associated to it. It was just minus one, minus one always. Right? Right. I think so. With flanking, I'm pretty sure. But that's so much better because then a one, one or a one, two can't block it because it'll die. Yeah. We've seen like pseudo stuff like that where it mm -hmm. pings anything that tries to block it or in recent years there have been cards with that, essentially this, that ability. This has been kind of characterized as a similar, like it's similar to it, but uh, really it just falls short, man. I uh, in, in practice, playing games with Bushido always seemed to turn into, it just turns it into a race, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's a race the Bushido player would usually lose because their creatures are small at dealing damage to a player. Mm -hmm. They're good at blocking, which is weird. But the, <laughs> it's like the Bor Boros blocking deck, basically. Exactly, because this was in the, the aggro colors, so mm -hmm. it's very strange. Well, I, I'm wondering, I don't think we're going to see Bushido as a keyword because there's just no way. Yeah. 
it's been ridiculed so much. I would much. be surprised. I think we should see Samurais, though. We should definitely see Samurais. I hope they give them a new ability. But I'm wondering if we will, we'll see uh, one Samurai or something that has Bajito, but it doesn't uh, say Bajito. Like, it, it says... Right, it's not keyworded. Yeah, if this creature is blocked or becomes blocked, it... it uh, or blocks or becomes blocked. Yeah. It's whatever. And I think it would be fine to have that, right? Like, when sure. it's on just one card, it's like, oh, okay, neat. This guy's powerful, so you don't want to get into combat with him. Yeah. Um, but when it's a fun. whole mechanic is when it starts to look a little silly. Yeah. Uh, the the whole set cannot revolve around this mechanic that is poor. Um, however, we do have another mechanic, which is the beginning of... It, it's, once again, a really awesome idea, executed not very well, but it is what the they had at the time. But it was the first seed of something that became uh, evergreen. It is now part of our everyday magic constantly, which are totally. flip cards. Now, a flip yes. card isn't a double-faced card. That's what you would normally think. Oh, you flip it over and it does something. No, this means flipped as in like upside down when you're like looking at it. So it has a title on the top and then an upside down title on the bottom. And basically it's a creature that transforms into another creature. And our basic kind of example is the student of elements, which is one in a blue for a one, one human wizard. And it says when student of elements has flying, you flip it and you turn it around. It becomes a legendary creature, which I'm reading this upside down. So hopefully I say this right. Uh, Tobita master of winds. And it is a three, three human wizard. It says creatures you control have flying. And a, there's a lot of different cards that have similar things to this, but the art box is smaller and kind of cut in half. So you have two different pictures of the character changing through their thing. Um, it's a cool idea. Like, it, you know, the transforming is amazing. We love transforming cards and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But this way of looking at it, if you've ever seen one before, you already know that it's kind of complicated the biggest thing is that if you tap it, it gets it starts to become extremely confusing which side is is it transformed to. If you just walk over to a board state, you don't you don't necessarily know. It depends on how people tap their creatures. Like it's right. It's, it, it's, it, it's, it's confusing. And there'd be people who would try to like attack this, tap it to the right, and then when they untap it, tap it to the left mm -hmm. um, to like get a free transform off it even if they hadn't met the condition and then it you could always just claim oh i didn't realize you know like it's it's kind of a free way to cheat without getting in trouble for it yeah but the like you said the idea is great they had they hit on the idea of a transforming creature here um and, and you know zach was mentioning if you've seen this you know how weird it is if you haven't like take out your phone right now and just look up student developments mtg and you'll like <laughs> these things are strange yeah uh, and the idea works really well in again in theory but this execution is just not ideal it's it really looks strange uh it's hard to parse and and the idea of when you're playing with an actual card you're not playing on arena you have to track which one it is constantly and it was really easy to, like, even if you weren't even trying to cheat, it was easy to kind of untap it the wrong way or whatever if you don't always tap to the right or, and untap back. Or yeah. The other thing that was hard is that a lot of the cards have activated abilities on them that are part of their condition to flipping. So you already have to tap right. it all the time just to use the ability to then maybe flip it. To flip it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it was, it's just, it's very confusing. So, um, it feels really scrunched it's and jumbled. It's more confusing than you think it's going to be, basically. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it won't be, but it is. Um, now, if every one of the art pieces was one of those, you know those pictures where you look at it, uh, like, right side up, and it looks like one face, and you flip it upside down, and it's a different face? Now, I wonder if that would make it feel better. <laughs> Probably not, but... <laughs> It would be it would have cool. Felt like it's expensive to print these cards. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, get them like commissioned to look really cool like that. But uh, in any case, um, I'm happy that they tried this, and it was like the seed for Innistrad, essentially. 
uh, pushing right. them. It was pushing the design space to the back of the card, essentially, uh, when they wanted more room for more words. Uh, so they, or, you know, hey, we have a lot of words these days. They've been wanting to put more words on magic cards forever. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is not a new idea. It is not a new idea. And, and and this execution does have some advantages over the DFC. Like it's definitely worse overall. Um, but you, when you draft one of these, you don't have to announce it to the table. That's true. Or if you're in paper, if this um, is in my hand, I can read what the other side does without making it completely obvious to my opponent that I have a double face card in my hand. That's really true as well. Um, you don't have to like take it out of the sleeve every time. Um, if you're playing commander, you don't have to draw it from your deck and realize you left it on the flipped side and have to flip it back just to play it. So, um, yeah, there are those little advantages, but I think the disadvantages probably outweigh them oh for sure yeah, yeah for sure though to be fair we never had to get any of those stupid transform cards in your packs that are just like the ones where you write the the name on it <laughs> yeah and, exactly um, i'm happy that we don't have to we didn't have to have those back in the day because i would have been pissed uh, if i opened a pack when i was a kid <laughs> being like what the fuck what is, the hell this? is this <laughs> yeah um, um so i don't think we'll see these back uh but i do expect at least a few double face cards to yeah. kind of to point out that they acknowledge that this is where those started that for sure old, i'd be surprised if there were no double face cards in, in neon dynasty i was thinking originally that we were kind of through all the double face card stuff then i was realizing no shit like coming up was where it started so we have to do some double faced stuff we, so. they have to be at least a few there's going to be a good amount of cards uh whatever is double faced i probably won't read it so um That'll be fun for me. I'll be able to, whoa, what's this card? That's new. Um, just like it was to go back and look at all these cards and be like, wow, what are these cards? I have no idea what they are. I'm really confused. Um, there's a lot of other really weird stuff that is in Champions of Kamigawa specifically, but we do have two more sets to go through in the block. So I don't want to try to go too deep on them just yet. Jeff, are there any things from Champions that you would like to talk about before we go on a beer break? Uh, yes. We need to talk about the lands. Oh, God. Fuck. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you're right. We do it's hard to, to mention Kamigawa without mentioning what dual lands were available to you. So I, I've given an example for all the listeners of a dual land that you might have played in Kamigawa block constructed if you're interested in having more than one color. Uh, this is Tranquil Garden. It's a land. You can tap it to add one colorless to your mana pool, or you can tap it to add green or white to your mana pool. Mm. If you do that, Tranquil Garden doesn't untap during your next untap step, though. What the fuck? <laughs> so I'm going to play gotta be some of the worst myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gotta be some of the worst dual lands I've ever seen. So I'm pretty sure that these are, um, number one, I'm, I'm fairly positive these are reprints. So this isn't the first time that they printed this land. Uh, okay. <laughs> and second, I'm pretty sure that the name for these lands are called nap lands because they take a little nap over your turn. Oh, I like yeah. that. So that's pretty sweet. Yeah, they were originally in Tempest. So, uh, yeah, I think I... Um, oh, yeah, the Tempest. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, more nap lands, stupid stuff. Uh, gosh. Um, I do hope in, uh, in, in Neon Dynasty, we do get some Zubera or Zuberas, as I used to say um, when I was mm -hmm. a kid. Uh, but I'm pretty sure the, the community says Zubera. Uh, but I think it would be fun to add a couple more. We did it with the, uh, the kind of the honed in cycle. So I would like to see some more Zubras, please. Yeah, so one thing I was looking out for is in, in the two Innistrad sets, they kind of surprised us with reprints so they gave us delver of secrets and then also thalia mm -hmm. which are two cards that people may not have expected them to reprint that were kind of high profile so i've been keeping an eye out for stuff in these sets that they could try to pull a similar move with you know um, but most of the cards are like most of the cards that you would recognize instantly from this set are like busted and mm -hmm. they're not going to reprint it and so or they're just combo pieces. They all ended up just being combo pieces that nobody likes. So I'm not totally sure. The best I could come up with is like Sakura Tribe Elder, maybe? 
they could reprint that. There, are, I could see Sakura Tribe Elder um, Kodama's Reach is going to get reprinted. Um, that is like a commander. yeah, but that's not like the high profile reprint. I mean, like, and then I was thinking maybe Azusa, but they actually already reprinted that semi recently. They did. So you're saying they're not going to reprint Glimpse of Nature, or they're not going to reprint Sensei's <laughs> Divining Top? I'm not thinking those are pretty much a hard no. Yeah, uh, yeah, probably. Like, and then you you look at stuff like what Kiki Jiki, is that mm. what they're gonna do? Like <laughs> no, but they're going. I know they have to do this. Okay, I did want to talk about Kiki Jiki. So uh, quickly, the goblins on um, Kamigawa are a little bit different. They're the Aki, and they have they almost have like a turtleish look. They have like these weird long noses, but their backs are like really rough and like spiky. And right. anyway. If you know what Kiki Jiki looks like, you know what Aki looks like. But I think yeah. they were going to make another version of Kiki Jiki. Yes, I would hope so. Yeah. Or like a descendant or something. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I guess that's true. Probably a descendant. Or I guess just a copy of Kiki Jiki. Maybe Kiki Jiki makes a copy of. Uh, oh, yeah. He he's just working copies himself. Copy of every Kiki few Jiki. Years to... That would be interesting. And then it just makes another version of Kiki Jiki. Hmm. Interesting. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, I'm excited for that. So uh, the things I want to see right now from this specific set are flip cards, really DFCs, and Descendants okay. of all these legendary characters and all the throwbacks, which is a normal thing you'd want from a, a plane that you're coming back to. But Yeah, I feel like that has to be the case. And individual cards, you know, you, you got Gifts Ungiven, like you got some all-stars in here, but most of them are just known for being combo pieces. That's true. Are we going to get sisters of Yamazaki? Do you think? Maybe. <laughs> I I couldn't couldn't even guess about that. Um, so uh, well, I guess the legendary land cycle is uh, likely to be remade. Whether probably, it's, yeah. We'll, we'll probably have like probably mono, not exactly reprinted, but probably monocolored because we ha we've been doing like monocolored, dual colored, monocolored uh, land cycles. So we'll probably get that right. again here. Um, but I do want to say, so if you don't know Brothers Yamazaki, it is the same card printed with different arts, which is something they used to do back in like alliances and stuff. Are we going to have one card that has multiple arts for that one card? I that hope work so. together? That, that would be cool. Even like, cause they used to do it a lot. There's like four different versions of like every spell. Then it was way overboard mm -hmm. cause it was really hard to tell what was happening. But if they do it a couple times and specific with. Brothers Yamazaki, it's like the same person, but just mirrored almost. I mean, they kind of do it now, but they just change the frame too. <laughs> but I guess that's true, yeah. It's like four different versions these days. All right, so <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, they do have different versions, different arts, but it's like drastically different. All right, that doesn't make me as excited. Man, they, they are for sure. Then. <laughs> All right. Um, but Jeff, with that, I think we should go on a beer break so we can get to these other uh, sets. In uh, Yeah, we got a lot more Kamigawa coming up. We got lots of good stuff. Or eh, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we got lots of stuff. We got lots of stuff. But let's hear a note from our sponsors. <laughs> This beer break is brought to you by our patrons over at Patreon. That's right. You're already supporting the show just by listening, but if you want to support the show more, the Patreon is the best way to do that. And when you become a patron, you get an exclusive invite to our after party, which is a mini episode recorded immediately after this one where we ramble on about uh, non-magic things. Plus, you get to vote on which co-host is your favorite by either buying me a beer. Or buying me a beer. Or if you want, you could even buy both of us a beer. That is allowed. That That is allowed. You could just support the show. <laughs> so go to patreon.com slash arena regulars to vote on your favorite host or your favorite show right now. Uh, all right, Jeff. Which beer did you bring for the evening? All right. So, as you know, we're doing a Shacklands takeover here, and this is their double. Dubel? Dubel? Du I think double. Double. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, it's a Belgian double, is the style, and it's just called double. As, as you mentioned, they're a fan of their Belgian brews over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the can design's pretty cool. It's just 
you know, looks like maybe something you might find in a monastery or something. And it's just two guys cheersing. Well, that's me and you, right? Or two two people. Yeah, that's that's us. Yeah, that's us. <laughs> um, they they put our likeness on the can. So check out our Instagram to see uh, us. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, I, we actually look identical. Yeah, yeah. I'm the one that's cheersing the beer. Um, so there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Um, uh, and it's 7%. Also, forgot to mention this before. I don't know why. Shacklands, big reason why I was excited about this brewery. It sounds like Shocklands, duh. Well, I don't think Shocklands had been invented yet because we're still just at Betrayers of Kamigawa. It's true. They were not invented yet. We just had pain lands. Um, which are much different and probably deal more damage to you. <laughs> uh, but quite a lot worse in qu- general. Qu- quite a bit worse. Um, but I think with these beers, if we happen to, to get some sort of Shockland vibes from them, maybe they could have nicknamed Shockland things. I don't think the brewery has okay. 10 beers. Uh, there's, there's less than that. I think it might be closer to seven-ish, seven or eight. We'll have um, to talk to them and let mm-hmm. them know they need to get that up to ten. Yeah, so um, maybe we'll make we'll make nicknames for the beers as Shocklands, but uh, this double, all right, like it. In. Um, so we are now in a different time. It is January two thousand and five. Betrayers of Kamigawa, a whole other year, has just come out, and I have just gotten a bunch of Christmas money, and I blew a lot of it on this set. <laughs> <laughs> oh. See, I don't have that, like, it's funny because I remember doing stuff like that with Mirrodin, but mm-hmm. that's when I was in grade seven. So maybe it's like a, a grade seven thing. It might be. There was a lot of things changing my life in grade seven, obviously, or sorry, seventh grade for me. Um it's different when you're in the States. <laughs> you, you say it at seventh grade. Yeah. Um, and maybe I was focusing more on magic. I was starting to get a little bit more money. You know, once you come to like, you're like 12 or 13, you start to get, uh, maybe I load my mowed lawns that summer or something, or, you know, my dad's right. giving like, me little jobs. I wouldn't say I had a job, but I had like, yeah, uh, you know, preteen job yeah. or whatever where you... Just like random gigs, right? So I helped somebody. The modern day equivalent of the paper route or whatever. Exactly, yeah. Oh, yeah, the paper route's gone. Crazy. So weird. Um, (laughs) But anyway, Jeff, we have some, some, as in two, mechanics to talk about. But do you want to talk about the first one? Oh, right. I'm glad I get to cover this one. The first mechanic from Betrayers is ninjutsu. Uh, As an example, I have here for you Ink Eyes, Servant of Oni, 4 Black Black for a legendary rat ninja. It's a 5-4 and has ninjutsu 3 Black Black, which means you can pay 3 Black Black and return an unblocked attacker you control to hand to put this card into play from your hand tapped and attacking. And whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you may put target creature card from that player's graveyard into play under your control. To clarify that last ability is not part of ninjutsu it's just part of ink eyes and one in a black to regenerate ink eyes um so basically if you've played with zareth san with or against it you've played you've played against or with ninjutsu um if they if you get managed to sneak by an unblocked attacker you can kind of like bring that attacker back to your hand and put the the ninjutsu creature into play so it's supposed to be like uh, they're losing their disguise. You thought it was some lowly peasant, but it turns out it was this badass ninja, and you, you're getting wrecked by it. Um, Surprise! This mechanic is awesome. This mechanic is amazing. <laughs> it is the best mechanic that came out of the set, and might be one of my favorite magic mechanics like ever. Yeah, I'd say it's the best mechanic in the block. It's definitely the best. Oh, so yeah, sorry. The best mechanic in the block, um, and it might want to. It could be one of my favorite mechanics, um, because as opposed to Pajito, this makes you think. Okay, I might actually want to block that samurai because the samurai could be a ninja. I don't know what's in their hand. Um, 
Now they didn't right. they didn't actually really work that way as far as like the game went. It tends to be a one one flyer that you can't block, and then it just turns into a ninja. Yeah, I was gonna say I think they kind of fixed it with Zarat San where it had to be a rogue or something. Mm-hmm. Um, this probably should have been a it has to be a ninja you're returning, but make flavor wise it makes sense that it doesn't have to be because like a ninja wouldn't disguise themselves as a different ninja exactly so what the the idea of it being in disguise is kind of what's happening here now again it can't really disguise itself as healer's hawk either That's... when it's a rat ninja but you know whatever yeah a lot of it was like oh here yeah it's a one one flyer a lot of people play this with like weird owls or like some unblockable uh snake thing. Right, i don't yeah, know random one one mm-hmm. unblockable thing but um, all of the ninjutsu creatures have a, like, when it deals combat damage to a player ability. Ink Eyes tend, happens right. to be the coolest and best one. And I love Ink Eyes so much. That's why I put it in here and I made... I love this card, it's too. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they all have something to do with that. So on Arena, we actually have... Nin- I mean, it's really similar to Zerath San, actually. It's super so. similar. Like, this one specifically. That's why Zerath San was pretty sick. Right. And the amount of times I forget that you have it has to be a rogue because I just think he has ninjutsu when he doesn't. He has like rogue jitsu. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, basically, the one that we, we have one on Arena, we have Ninja of the Deep Hours, which is like a popper all star. Um, but it ninjutsu's for mm-hmm. one and a blue. And uh, when it hits a player, you draw a card. Uh, so you can already play with ninjutsu on Arena. And I'm wondering if we're going to get. May probably not a reprint of that card, but uh, maybe some of the old ninjas are come back. Or I really hope that ninjutsu comes back as like a full format ability. I just don't know if it will. So we have like a, a preview from Neon Dynasty, uh, and it's a creature that gives all of the creatures in your hand ninjutsu. So that could be like a one off thing, but I, I think that to me means that ninjutsu is in the set. Right? Like, it, it, it's it got to be. Like, I feel like if this was a one-off, they would write out what it is. Yeah. Right? They wouldn't use the keyword. Unless the keyword is in the set. That's true. And this is from actual Neon Dynasty, not like the, the um, Commander product. Commander yeah. product or whatever, yeah. Though this is a... <laughs> so, I'm pretty confident that Ninjutsu is actually in Neon Dynasty, which is awesome. Yeah. I really hope there's more of it, and not just this guy. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's sick. especially because I've just been loving like this blue black stuff, you know, rogues is so fun. Uh, in the <laughs> decathlon, I didn't say this before, but I ended up winning with a rogue type deck. Um, so, you know, Hey, sneaky creatures yes. <laughs> removal sounds great. I, um, I want, I want ninjutsu in my life. Yeah. If it's like rogues <sighs> without the mills, so people don't hate you quite as much for mm-hmm. playing it. I'm happy with that. That's true. That's true. Um, I think that'll work out. Yeah. Blue black ninjas, my new favorite standard deck. Mm-hmm. I've seen one card that I probably will not play in the deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause you're like, well, I don't really care about this one cause it doesn't have ninjutsu. Yeah. My stuff's already going to have ninjutsu, buddy. I don't need it. I don't need more stuff. <laughs> so before we move on, if there's one card we have right now that you want to give ninjutsu to, which card is it? Like a card that is in this set or like in a, that no, is already on Arena? That's already on Arena. That you're going to use this this card. Uh, the card that we're talking about is Satoru Umezawa. Oh, I see. If I wanted to combo with Satoru. Yes, that you're going to play with Satoru. Uh, good question. So what has the best saboteur trigger so basically it's uh which creature would you like to give ninjutsu and why is it cultivator colossus <laughs> is cultivator colossus so wait so you you trigger etbs off this right yeah it enters the battlefield oh yeah then definitely it's called <laughs> I, <laughs> I was thinking saboteur of it abilities but i forgot about just plain old-fashioned etb abilities there you go and, uh, yeah yeah this... <laughs> obviously that's the combo that i'm gonna have to make work now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i want this guy okay cultivator colossus and five lands in my hand that's the dream there you go 
Hey, I mean, like, you... And I want to draw nothing but lands, and I want to go turn three this guy. You have no blockers. Turn four. <laughs> attack with this guy. <laughs> I have another question for you, though. Do you think anyone will ever not block Satoru Umazawa? No. Never. They're How always could you block. ever not block this thing? <laughs> okay. It could be anything. We are definitely talking more about this card than I thought, so we should actually read it. So, um, yeah, <laughs> Satoru Uz- <laughs> Uz- <laughs> Oh, fuck, I'm drinking a 7% now, and you can tell everything's You have to say now. this name again later, so. I'm going to say it right now. Okay. <clears throat> Satoru Uzuma. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got it, I got it. Uh-huh. I have, yeah. I got it, Okay. <clears throat> So, Satoru Umezawa is one blue-black for a 2-4 legendary creature, Human Ninja. He says, whenever you activate a ninjutsu ability, look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. It only triggers once each turn. And then it says, each creature card in your hand has ninjutsu, two blue-black. So... This is why you can turn any creature in your deck or really just your hand into a ninja fighting thing. Um, and when this first came out, Instagram, there was a storm of cards that were like, every Praetor was like, oh, hello, I am a ninja. <laughs> and like every, um, <laughs> like Eldrazi was like, hello, fellow ninjas. I am also a ninja. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, this card seems more like the meme dream kind of thing to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can imagine a lot of fun that you could have with this card. I think it's a cool design. It's so cool. Like, this type of design just risks being broken because you can pay, play any creature for two blue-black. But this execution is definitely not broken. Because, first of all, you have to have a creature that's unblocked while this is face-up on the table that you can do this. Mm-hmm. That's why I was saying nobody's ever not going to block this because this could be Emrakul in disguise. Exactly. So, uh, this thing is awesome, and uh, yeah, I, I'm happy they were able to get like some sort of kind of sneak attack card into the set that's in different colors. You you could even Zareth sand this, even though it's not a rogue. That's true. You know that is true. What's your Zareth sand play with non rogue creatures? That's probably the best combo. That would be great. No one's expecting that one. You know. No one expects the Zareth Sand ninjutsu without him using the ability from his hand. Um, yeah, no one expects the Zareth Sand no other rogues deck. <laughs> <laughs> Turn rogues should really be ninjas in all of magic. But um, anyway, uh, let's keep moving on. I want to talk about another ability that's super weird and just back to the theme of, wow, this seems kind of cool, but what the fuck is this? Here we go. We have Offering. So in Kamigawa, there's a lot of gods, kind of, or things, spirits, beings that people tend to worship, at least in Betrayers. And um, we have this, it's not considered a god, but it, eh, the way it works out, it kind of is. This is uh, Patron of the Moon is our example for offering. It is five blue blue for a five four legendary creature spirit, and it has Moonfolk offering, which means you may play this spell anytime you can play an instant by sacrificing a Moonfolk and paying the difference in mana costs between this and the sacrifice Moonfolk. Mana costs include the color. It is also a creature that has flying, and you can pay one generic mana to put up to two land cards from your hand on the battlefield tapped. This card is so fucking weird. (laughs) (laughs) So the idea is that you get... So it's a seven drop, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm trying to, like, turn three Moonfolk, turn four this, uh, turn five, put a whole bunch put two lands put all my lands into play i guess yeah (laughs) yeah so first offering so there is a cycle of offering cards uh it's one from each color and they all have weird tribes associated with them so the blue one is moon folk which i don't know if we've seen since necessarily um 
Uh, I think the white. Well, I was going to say, I don't even know why you bothered to read the reminder text on Moonfolk Offering. I'm sure everyone knows what Moonfolk, <laughs> Moonfolk Offering, Moonfolk offering is. Um, <laughs> the other offerings, there is uh, like Fox Offering, which is Kitsune. Um, I think the black one is for rats. The green one is for snakes. And the, the, the red one is for goblins, which is really boring because goblins are everywhere. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> I loved that they had these crazy, stupid, obscure tribes that, like, cared about members of their tribe. (laughs) It wasn't just like, oh, yeah, there's this random creature type we have. Um, And uh, and then they happen to be in this place. It's like, no, they have this weird spirit god that they can sacrifice themselves to to make the creature come into play at instant speed and cheaper. (laughs) That's what I don't get. Why, Why instant speed? And why can I get it like <laughs> instant speed makes it good totally man. for free. The the thing that's weird with, but I could play it for like no blue mana ostensibly. Yeah. The weird thing with it is that you can't sacrifice more than one moonfolk. I think you have to sacrifice one. Yeah. These people need to like, you know, pray to gods that will let them mass sacrifice. Exactly. Cause like the goblin one, you need a really expensive goblin to sacrifice. You can't just sacrifice a bunch of little stupid ones. And it doesn't care about <laughs> tokens because tokens don't have right. mana values. So you have to sacrifice something you actually spent mana on, essentially. Yeah. I think uh, this card is so weird. I want something weird like this in the new set. Um, but... I wanted to spend some time because offering isn't that crazy to me. It's like, oh, you sacrifice a creature of the same tribe. You get to play this bigger one, whatever. What I do want to talk about, and I don't, we're not going to see offering. I don't think, I don't think it's going to be a thing in the new set. I did want to talk about, I'd say pretty much no chance. No chance. Um, I did want to talk about moon folk for a little bit and some of the weird tribes. Okay. So it's ability. You pay one generic mana to put two lands from your hand onto the battlefield tapped. The reason this matters at all is because Moonfolk have a very special ability, which is basically you tap generic mana and then you return lands to your hand to activate their abilities. Um, And Moonfolk do it a lot. All of the Moonfolk are like, hey, so you tap two lands, uh, sorry, tap, uh, pay two generic mana, return a land to your hand, you tap a different land or you bounce a creature or you uh, make somebody mill some cards or something. Um, So basically when you play a Moonfolk deck, your entire hand is going to be full of lands and then you have to have this guy to put the lands back into the battlefield, which once again is sweet. I have a little hint preview, sneak preview. uh, I have a bunch of lands in my hands. Awesome. I'm so happy I can pick up the lands from the battlefield and put in my hand. Me, as like a 12 year old, thought this was crazy cool. What an interesting, weird thing. I love this so much. Yeah, I'm going to put my lands in my hand and mill you two cards and then play this and sacrifice something to put the lands back on the battlefield to draw them again. It's not good. <laughs> it's not cool. So to me, this encapsulates everything we talked about in Kanigawa, where it's like they had a lot of great ideas. They had too many great ideas. Mm-hmm. And like the flavor wise and their execution just comes across as weird. And offering is the same. It's like, um, didn't they do this eventually in a different way with uh, the Eldrazi on Innistrad? Like they had a, a very similar thing emerge right yeah it was emerge yeah. yeah it's like it's that was kind of like fixed offering and i don't even think it was all the way fixed because that mechanic still kind of sucked but uh <laughs> they had a, a really cool idea of you sacrifice someone to bring your god forth uh and so it's some powerful card mm-hmm. that you sh- that you can ramp out early as a tribal payoff like that's all really cool um, and then even like we're talking about moon folk, but one of the sub themes of Kamigawa block is weird, weird ass tribes. It's like a pseudo tribal set or block, but all the tribes are really unusual with the exception of goblins. Mm-hmm. So like you said, there's rats and snakes and we've talked about samurais and there's moon folk that have 
that even have weird activation abilities and stuff. And it's just like, when you look back on this block, you're like, there was some good designers here with some really great ideas. But everything just reads as very, very weird. It's just weird. So, it's so <laughs> weird. Um, and the, to me, one of the really strong flavor things, but the worst play experiences was the tribe of like demons and ogres. Oh yeah, the Oni. Yeah, the Oni. So they're like the, it was like the Rakdos deck kind of. Um, and basically the demons would be these sweet, strong creatures. But if you didn't have an ogre on your side of the battlefield, they would either sacrifice themselves or like deal you damage or they needed to sacrifice ogres every turn to stay alive. Like... It was very flavorful, but, like, sucked to play. Like, it really sucked. Right. And I think that's the theme of the block, is, like, you're talking about reading these cards as a kid and being like, that's awesome. And I think a lot of people read them and was like, that's awesome. And then you just play a few games and you're like, this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, like, so many cool ideas, but, like, it just didn't work out. They just went off the rails with, like, cool flavor ideas and trying to do whatever they could to make a mechanic that matched that and maybe didn't devote enough time to actually like playing it. And it's like, is this fun to play? Cause ultimately it's a game. Yeah. Right? It has to be fun to play. Now, to be fair, this is kind of one of the first times that they were taking something from the real world, like the feudal Japan myths and legends and making a magic set out of it. Now they've done this a lot since then. And this was a really big learning uh, experience for wizards and the design team and everyone there and they learned a lot of lessons from the set ultimately it wasn't extremely successful though i'm happy that we actually are coming back to it because there has been so many years of mark rosewater saying we will never come back to kamigawa and i think this is a really good it's really good for them to come back and be like hey we're gonna do it different but we're gonna do it right and they better do it right. <laughs> they better, yeah. They better do it right. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned that because I was just thinking, like the Greek mythology mm -hmm. set and the Egyptian mythology set. You know, if this is Japanese mythology, I didn't really like those either. I'm the first go, go about like um, maybe the Norse one is the closest mm -hmm. to a success on the first try with uh, Kaldheim, but I think it's just difficult to take mythology and turn it into a magic set because you're so tempted to do something cool flavor wise that you overlook actually playing the game. yeah but in that same point i think the biggest problems with both of those sets were kamigawa there were a lot of creatures that were really high mana values with really low power and stats and theros the first time we went there really expensive creatures that had really small powers because you're doing all this enchantment stuff that's like right. it was like why aren't you just make the cards playable <laughs> like not even good just playable like yeah <laughs> and like a little less complicated we can fill in the gaps and i think they've learned this on what the flavor is mm -hmm. without it being exactly right yeah. You know? yeah it just it goes a little overboard and a little too um in their own head uh, the one thing I did want to talk about Betrayers before we move on to the next thing is I did like the cycle of uncommon um, uh, land enchantments. And they were specific to uh, basic land types. The Genjus. The Genjus, yeah. Um, I thought they were pretty cool. Uh, we are very familiar with uh, creature lands now. We play with a lot of them from AFR. But these were in a, a cycle of enchantments that would turn your regular land like a basic land into a creature land um the one that i probably saw the most my buddy would play this one all the time with genju of the spires which is a single red for an enchant a mountain enchantment and uh when it's on there you can pay two generic to make it a six one red uh spirit creature until end of turn um but the cool thing with those also is that if they died, they would just return right back to your hand. You can play them again and do it and over and over again. So uh, I did like that. I'm interested to see if they try to do something like that because we do already have like this kind of creature land world. So if they add more, I don't know if they will um, devote a, an entire cycle to it. Um, 
or bring the other ones back. But um, I thought those were kind of cool. They weren't extremely powerful or fantastic, um, but I kind of like them. I also like enchantments. So from what I hear, a couple of them were kind of relevant competitive play. I think Genju of the Spires actually is the the usual example mm-hmm. of that fit into the mono red deck of the the age. I, I believe because yeah. it's a good like way to get uh, reach for your red mm-hmm. deck. Right? It's like, well, I'm going to do this every turn, so you better always have an answer. Yeah, yeah, and uh, obviously we can't talk about this set without talking about Umazawa's GTA. Oh, of course. Uh, which I'm sure, you know, everyone knows this card. If you don't, you know, we won't read it, but uh, you can look it up. But this was the card that I ran into twice in one draft. And when I look back on that, I feel like maybe there was some some foul play involved and people just bringing their GTAs and you put it in whatever deck you draft and beat up on the you mm-hmm. know 13-year-old kid or whatever. But uh, I, I just I remember playing both those games and I was like, I don't think there's any possible way that I can win because I'm not able to like at, like I have a five five and a four four and you have a one one and I'm afraid of getting in combat with you because because the GT like that's so dumb. yeah yeah um, the GT is uh, the most powerful card that has ever been uh, put in a like intro theme deck like. Oh, for think sure. about like the planeswalker decks that they used to make or like even the challenger decks they make now and stuff the usually these were like ten dollars and you get two rares and this one was one of them is a gt and you <laughs> like <laughs> it ended up being such a powerful card that it uh they had to change the legend rule because people would play this card in a turn it's a legendary artifact so you can only have one but at the time anyone playing the game could only have one so if you people would put jt just in their deck so that they could blow up the other person's jt like that's it like if two were in play at the same time they would sacrifice themselves so it's kind of like right. a, a colorless shatter specifically for jt um right even like a creatureless deck would play it to, to destroy the creature decks GTA. which is nuts so go check out that card it's uh super sweet and um yeah <laughs> but i think betrayers of all the the kamigawa stuff was my favorite i don't uh, i think a lot of it had to do actually with the fact that i had money at the time and i ended up buying a lot of it and so i had a lot of the cards and uh, i was just i loved i thought it was all so awesome i think looking back when i was looking at the theme decks for this uh this chunk i think i bought all of them um i had Oh, nice. Like, and I don't even remember thinking on purpose to do that. I've never done that before or since, but I, I have all the cards from all those, those decks and I definitely tried to build all of them. So that's pretty cool. I think like overall, just looking at these cards, this was the least egregious of the three sets. If you take away Uma's always GTA, mm-hmm. um, like it had ninjutsu, it had some cool stuff. It did have the shoals. Mm-hmm. which were another issue they were like free spells but like at the time i didn't know those cards were even good so uh, it's like one of those looking back it's funny because to me i had a blazing shawl uh so b- basically it's a free spell it, it's the same kind of thing as like uh, force of will where you exile a card from your hand it's the same color as the spell but it's mana value uh affects the spell that you play um right it's an it's an x, x, x spell, spell essentially and um i had a blazing shawl and i thought they were it was the coolest thing i was like oh this is, i'm gonna get somebody with this yeah well blazing shawl is the one that got banned in oh did it because uh yeah you play infect creatures and blazing oh shawl. my god <laughs> that is exactly what i want to do with that card that sounds amazing <laughs> holy shit it's literally turn two kills if that is if i could play modern like that I would. I'm so down. Like I would 100. <laughs> Turn one glistener elf. I hope you have a removal spell. <sighs> that sounds so good. Oh, oh, I love that. I love that that happened. I'm sad I wasn't a part of it, but I love that it happened. Um, I was like the first ever modern pro tour, and this these decks just dominated, and they banned it. Damn, <laughs> it, was like, it was very quick. That is, that's hilarious. Um, all right. Well, Betrayers is by far my favorite, so I'm excited to get into the next thing um 
Before we move into saviors, Jeff, do you have any last thoughts about betrayers? Are there any cards you want to talk about? <laughs> you always got to ask me about last thoughts. Uh, I do. Okay. I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Gorio's Vengeance. This was like a reanimator instant that could only reanimate instants. Uh, sorry, legendary creatures. Uh, and that creature gains haste and you remove it from the uh, game. So you exile it at the end of turn. Uh, I've always loved this card. I like reanimator strategies. And this one was particularly cool because you had to figure out how to get something big and bad, but just for one turn. And now that they do a lot more legendaries and stuff, who knows? But uh, it had splice onto arcane. Uh, which we mentioned from the previous set. So I don't really expect this guy to be back, but uh, this was a cool card. I I wanted to, like, I actually played this in Modern occasionally to bring back uh, Jace Friend's Prodigy, and then you transform it, and it doesn't exile anymore. So you, like, bring it back, it has haste, so you tap it to transform it, and then you got your Planeswalker. So it was like a reanimating a Planeswalker. Interesting. I was I thought that the modern thing to do was to play this and then go get Grizzlebrand and then, like, draw a bunch of cards and hit him for seven. And Yeah, that was, like, the all-in combo deck. There was also a, an Esper version that would... The main targets were Jace, and then you could uh, recast this. Oh, the Jace. that's true. Ooh. And... Uh, and the other target that made it Esper was like uh, the Ghost Council. Oh, uh, awesome! Guy. That's sick. Could he you also exile it? Himself oh, that's out. so cool. Wait, I that sounds really fun too. Um, yeah, I, I think that I could. Oh, it has splice on Arcane, so they're not going to reprint it. Dang it! They've put this in Master I sets know, before. Right? <laughs> um, maybe in the Commander product they could put this in there. Um, and I do think it's one of those cards that needs a reprint because mm -hmm. I think the prices are a little inflated. I think it's going up. Um, once again, another reason why Arena is awesome because we don't have to deal with card prices. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> Jeff, let's move to Saviors of Kamigawa, which is the just death of everything. Um, <laughs> this is the like LOL WTF. This is the, uh, this is a magic set? I can't. Yeah, no. It, this one is hard to believe. When I'm looking back at this set, I'm like, what is happening? It really here? is. It's um, This was released in June of 2005. Um, I had some of these cards when I went on. <laughs> I went to summer camp in the Boy Scouts, and we played unsleeved my ninjutsu deck on a picnic table in, <laughs> in, in uh, summer camp, which fucked up all my uh, uh, ink eyes. But um, anyway... Yeah, yeah. Uh, in my GT, you're playing your Black Lotus. My, my GT is also fucked up because of that. So anyway, uh, Jeff. Uh, oh, sorry. Before we get into the mechanics, um, this set revolved all around wisdom, which is kind of the idea of the amount of cards that you have in your hand matters. And so that seems kind of cool for about one second before you start to think about it in any capacity because what you realize is by saying amount of cards in your hand matters you're actually adding a punishment to playing cards that's what you're doing yep. you're saying every time you play a card you lose some wisdom so it's like a negative <laughs> reinforcement to every card you play and that counts for lands and spells so you are actually incentivized not necessarily to play a land like on turn three. You might not want to play a land because it might mess with your wisdom. Which <laughs> is crazy. Think of all the games you could have won because you didn't draw your third land. This is a set that says, hey, don't play your third land because maybe you'll win. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> maybe you need that wisdom. Like, it's... I understand a lot of people really like that it this is the most like you're not really playing a game and it's just pure strategic analysis. Should I play my land on turn three? Yes or no? Some people find that decision interesting, but magic has enough complexity that you don't need that. You don't need people sitting there not playing anything and passing the turn back and forth to each other. And, you know, trying to avoid discarding the hand size. Like, you just don't need this. This is... It's also, think about... Um, in Arena, it's fantastic. I can just hover over their thing, and it tells me how many cards are in their hand. Imagine having to ask your opponent... Every, oh, yeah, you're just asking every, every turn. Every turn. How many cards are in your hand? 
how many cards in your hand? Just so you didn't get off by one or something went wrong. Um, right. Jeff, would you like to uh, show us our first mechanic that cares about... No, it's not even just the first one that cares about cards in hand, but the first one for this set. Well, and just an overall last point on cards that care about cards in hand is that when you play one of them, you have lost a card in hand. So they're already naturally pretty bad because if both you and your opponent do nothing and then you play it, you have less fewer cards in hand than your opponent because you play yeah. it. So uh, it's already like you're at a disadvantage in wisdom by playing a card that cares about wisdom. God. All right, so our first mechanic is sweep. Uh, this is a beauty, an absolute beauty. So we'll go into sink into Takanuma, three and a black, sorcery, arcane. Okay. Okay, in case you wanted to splice onto this. And uh, it has sweep, which says return any number of swamps you control to their owner's hand. Target player discards a card for each swamp returned this way. So the sweep mechanic is, you know, we were talking about Moonfolk. It's return lands to your hand to get a more powerful spell. It's like an X spell, but instead of the X being mana, it's literally returning the land to your hand. Sick. So not only did I have to tap my lands to play this, but I also get to return them to my hand. Amazing. That's a... that's Yeah, it's great. But you... <laughs> No, no, you get to improve your wisdom. That's true, yeah. I get to have like nine cards and then discard some lands. And then I can't play anything next turn. It's amazing. So good. But my opponent doesn't have any cards in hand. So they were, oh, wait, they draw something. Oh, they have lands to play stuff? Damn. All right, well, sucks to be me, I guess. To be fair, uh, as far as these sweep cards go, I believe that there are four. Uh, this is one of the four sweep cards that were ever made. Um, the, yeah, of course there's not five. That would be it ridiculous. It would be ridiculous. Um, two of them are white. One of them is red, and this is the black one. Um, I think the red one deals damage to a creature, and then the white ones are either one creature gets uh, plus one plus one for each land you returned, or all your creatures get plus one plus one for each land you returned, which seems... Okay. The aggro ones make a bit more sense because it's going to be the last card you play. But everything else is like, right. okay, thank God this says arcane. So you can like splice onto it before you can't play any cards forever. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. It's like, uh, I guess the, that's the thing about the uh, uh, wisdom is our splice onto arcane really saves the day. Right. Because you have all the spells you've played in your hand still kind of some of them. Um, the sweep thing is just like, this one specifically is the one I wanted to choose to talk about because it's so bad in the sense that, okay, so turn four, you can play this and it doesn't do anything unless you return lands to your hand. Like it, it doesn't make you discard any cards plus whatever lands you, you return. No, no. Yeah. It's only the ones that you return. So um, turn four, you could return four lands, make them discard four cards. Their hand's probably empty, maybe. But like turn six, so you can splice something onto it. It's like sick. Turn six, how many cards do they have in their hand? I don't know. Two, I guess. So you paid six to like deal two damage to their face. <laughs> it's the worst mind It's so ever. bad. Like, ugh. Anyway. Well, no, see, that's the thing. In this set, they probably still have seven cards. That's true when they're playing. But like... Because <laughs> they needed to keep their wisdom high. Uh, how... How excited would you be if I told you, hey, do you want to play this game with me? So you're going to draw seven cards, and then you should never play a card, and you might win. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like What fun, a fun Zach. game. Let's give it a go. How do you play? Don't. And then you reveal saviors of kind of. <laughs> Don't do anything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's this thing. Um, I, 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 let's move on. I'm done with sweep. Uh, there's a better mechanic. Sweep was sweep ridiculous. Was ridiculous. Uh, this next one I like a bit better. Um, it is, uh, channel. All right. So basically channel is, uh, if you played through gate crash or you've seen a gate crash card, it's similar to blood rush, um, where it's a creature that you can either play and it has an ability that it does, or you can, uh, pay an amount of mana, discard it from your hand and then give something else, another creature, the abilities the creature had. So our, our, um, 
Example is Shinnin of Life's Roar, which is one in a green for a 1-2 spirit that says all creatures able to block Shinnin of Life's Roar do so. It has channel. It is a two green green. You can discard it from your hand and all creatures able to block target creature this turn do so. So it's just giving another creature its ability. There is a bunch of cycles of this uh, uh, effect of all the different colors and different rarities. Jeff, what do you think about this, this ability channel? This is by far the best mechanic in this set. Yes. But overall, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> like you, you compare it to Blood Rush, and that's good, because Blood Rush is kind of like, I don't know, a more natural version of this, I think, because the creatures are, you know... It, it's the same thing, but it's, it's less random. It feels more uh, focused. And ultimately, this is them trying to make something that can be a creature or a spell. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we talked about how transforming DFCs kind of took over the flip cards, the only, you know, the best mechanic from champions. It feels to me like modal DFCs kind of replace this type of thing uh, in terms of what they do. Now, technically, you can't counter a channel spell because it just, like, goes on the stack and it's not a spell you're casting. Mm -hmm. But you can, to me, that's what they were trying to do here that, is like a creature slash spell. I could see them bringing this back, I guess, but it would have to be different than this. It wouldn't be like a creature turns into a spell because MDFCs do that in a different way. I don't know. It could be like a spell land. No, I guess we kind of had those in Zendikar Rising. So I don't know. I don't know what channel would be now. Um, it's not the worst mechanic. It's just like I think we've kind of improved on it. If they brought it back, it would just be kind of as a reference to this. It's like, hey, this was the least shitty mechanic in Saviors of Kamigawa. We'll make like a cycle that has it. Yeah, I mean, like if we had one now that was like, um, it's a spirit on one side and arcane spell on the other. If they continue to do something like that, that would be kind of nice. Cause then you're like, Oh, either I have a creature or an arcane spell that could be something, something, um, would make those cards probably, I mean, obviously a lot better. I do like that. We, so we have had creatures that can be spells, spells that can be creatures, those kinds of things. It's really important that we don't have cards that are, um, uh, spells that can be spells and creatures like adventure where it's like oh it's a spell first right. and then a creature what about all three like an adventure creature that has that is an mdfc with a land on the back i mean that's just your deck right <laughs> that's just a deck <laughs> like, that's not even <laughs> it's just like bone crusher giant but if you're if you don't have lands you could play it as a mount <laughs> yeah totally uh fuck that'd be horrible <laughs> jesus um <laughs> but uh anyway i I do kind of like these. I would like to see something similar to it. I don't think they'll, they'll do, like you were saying, channel. We have new technology that can make it uh, more elegant. But um, the tying of the two abilities together is, is nice. And, um, and I do kind of like this. So Yeah, it's a nice, it's, you know, kind of like our earlier sets. This is actually a, a cool thing that they've just found a better way to do since then. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it was a nice but like, seed, right? We had some good seeds. Unlike Sweep, it's, you know, Sweep, which is just all around terrible. Yeah. Uh, this was, this had something there. All right. This had something there. However, this next one, do you think the next one had something there? <laughs> it might be the worst of the three. I don't know. Do you think? Uh, <laughs> maybe. It's so bad. It's pretty bad. It's so bad. All right. So the, the next mechanic was called Epic. And uh, we had to use this as our example. It's Enduring Ideal, five white, white for a sorcery. Search your library for an enchantment card and put it into play, then shuffle your library. You might be thinking, wow, that's kind of powerful. Okay, five white, white for that. It has Epic, which says for the rest of the game, you can't play spells. Good start to a mechanic. Um, and then at the beginning of each of your upkeeps, copy this spell except for its epic ability. So it's rebound, but forever. So you, you play a spell, and then you don't get to do anything but cast that spell every turn for the rest of the game. Hmm. Fun. <laughs> it's horrible. Like, 
I do enjoy only playing the game during my upkeep, just to be fair. So Yeah, I, I just want to only cast this during my upkeep. I'm also like a little loosely confused about why it says copy it except for its epic ability. Because the epic ability says you can't play spells anymore. Oh, no, no. It says it because otherwise it would be exponential because I would have two epics on the stack. Oh, next turn, oh, 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 oh. And, would, and then I would get two. And yeah, yeah. Well, then okay. that would be really That's good. <laughs> then it would be worth playing. Yeah. <laughs> so even like this is a card that if it's good in the metagame, the metagame is awful. And if it's bad in the metagame or like if, if nobody it's so bad that nobody plays it, then what's the point, right? Like in any situation where this card is good, that's a miserable experience because you're getting enchantments that obviously like lock the opponent out of the game while you continue to, to do this nonsense. Um, <laughs> so if this card actually sees any play, it's, it's a bad situation for the game. And if the card doesn't see any play, why make it in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure this specific card saw uh, play in tournaments. Um, the yep. other yes, ones, did. this is like probably the best one just because yeah. the other ones are like the blue one. You steal a card from the other person's deck. That's like a permanent, um, which seems pretty fun depending on what your opponent's deck is. But the green one just makes snakes, uh, depending on the cards in your hand, which is going to get higher because you can't play anything. So, sweet. Epic means your hand size is huge because you'll never play a card again. There you go. Your wisdom. Sick. Yeah. Your wisdom's awesome. I think the red one... You just got to remember not to play your lands because they're they're pointless. Don't forget. That's true. Yeah, just keep leave them in your hand. Don't foolishly reduce your wisdom cuts. Unless your you're just going to discard cards, but lands. like whatever. Uh, the black one mills your opponent, kind of. And then I think the red one like deals damage to creatures, but like, how are you going to win the game? <laughs> deals damage to creatures? I can't li literally can't win now unless I had one creature that I'm planning on attacking with. Every that doesn't get killed. <laughs> um my opponent plays Wrath oh, of God sorry. and I have to concede. It does. <laughs> it, it can deal damage to players. Never mind. But you have to remove oh, okay. a non... That makes more sense because like it... So the red one says, um, remove cards from the top of your library <laughs> until you remove a non-land card. It deals damage to target creature or player equal to the card's uh, mana value. So... Uh, oh, so it's like so unplayable because you could actually like mill yourself out before you kill them. Yeah. Yeah, you could. This set was bad. <laughs> yeah, this, um, the, the theme was a, a horrible theme to begin with. Like, the cards in hand matters. Yeah, there's a lot and of... And the execution on the mechanics was rough. Yeah. Um, there's a cycle of creatures that care about the cards in your hand or your opponent's hand as far as their power and toughness that were rare. Um, there's a yeah. lot of creatures that get stronger if you have cards in your hand and not and it, they reduce your opponent's hand size or make your hand size bigger and all this stuff um there's a reason why you haven't seen it was an experiment in hand size and definitely a failed one yeah the best thing about this set is the um the icon for the set looks really cool the set symbol i do like that actually is good yeah I was trying to come up with something positive to say about Saviors of Kamigawa. Yeah. You, That's it. I do agree with it's, that. It's yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> I, I enjoy that quite a bit. Uh, everything else is pretty pretty rough. Uh, like you said before, it's kind of like combo-centric stuff. It's very interesting to look through. Please do. And commander stuff. There's a bunch of commander stuff. So go for that. Mechanics-wise, <laughs> I Just. think I like to think they learned a lot of lessons from designing this set, right? So the set has its place in that sense. They really took, went outside the box and tried some weird stuff and some cool stuff in this block, um, but ultimately they didn't get the reaction that they were hoping for. Like, imagine if this set, this block was really popular. This this could be what magic looks like now. <laughs> that's true this wouldn't look weird to us because this block was so popular that they kept doing it it just looks weird now because it was like a failed experiment for the most part i think i don't see a world where it would have succeeded but 
I think you're right. Um, Agreed. Yeah. I think this entire, like, this block, Kamigawa, there were a couple things that went well. Um, Flavor-wise, really strong, awesome. Art, super dope. And ninjutsu, amazing. And I think people liked the legendary theme. As yeah, well. sorry. There's just a lot of legendary creatures. Legendary creatures and some cards that cared about legendary creatures and that mattering. Awesome. Really awesome. Um, tied into a lot of story stuff. Uh, this was also back when the Fat Packs had the, uh, the book. So I actually had the Betrayers of Kamigawa book, the novel, uh, which right. I actually read. Uh, I don't remember anything because I didn't know what was happening since it was the second in the series of three. Uh, I was very <laughs> confused. But um, I they don't do that anymore. Uh, makes sense because you can just put all the, the work online. But in any case, I think the block was necessary. And I'm very happy that it happened. And they went through it and learned buckets and buckets of lessons. Like... This is, if without Kamigawa, Innistrad would not be what it is. Do you know what I mean? Like, right, exactly. You had to go through these yeah. other rings. So there, I put a lot of respect on Kamigawa, even though it was a rough period. And I kind of stopped playing Magic a little bit after that. Like, Kamigawa is kind of the end of it. My friends just dropped out, you know? Like, it, it could have been the block that, like, you know, quote unquote killed the set, but it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And they, they learned a lot. And like we said, a lot of these mechanics ended up being tuned and fixed mm -hmm. and being some of the most popular mechanics like ever. ever. So there was, they were trying new stuff that was a little beyond their ability to actually make. Um, but who knows, you know, would we have all the double-faced cards that we have now without them trying the flip cards? Exactly. So anyway, folks, that is... Kamigawa block, except for there's one card that needs to be talked about. One, specifically mm -hmm. one, that I think Jeff has something to say about. I, I demand this card be reprinted in Neon Dynasty. So um, this is, of course, one of the most powerful cards of all time. Uh, it's called One With Nothing. Uh, if you haven't heard of this card, it's just just one black mana for an instant that says discard your hand. That's it? Uh, yeah. No, there's nothing after that. That's it. That's No, you're not right. In the set that cares about you having a lot of cards in your hand, by the way. That's where the card that says discard your hand shows up. You said there's nothing beyond that. There is flavor text. Oh, yeah. of course. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. There is something. When nothing remains, everything is equally possible. I mean, is that true? <laughs> That's telling you how to use the card, right? Don't. <laughs> Once you discard your hand, you could do anything. Turn one, discard your hand, and then you have one land. So maybe later you'll be able to sweep that one land back to your hand and have more cards. Um, I, I think what this card is saying is like it's actually the designers telling you this block is or this set is brutal. <laughs> just discard all of it. Just get rid of it. <laughs> just don't even <laughs> just don't even play with this. <laughs> just throw it away. Um, if yeah. you are fascinated by this card and the idea of one with nothing and, and a card that would seemingly have no purpose. Um, uh, there is a video about this on YouTube uh, by the magic man, Sam Ristic studies. He goes uh, deep dive into one with nothing and talks about it. And there is actually a deck that has a perfect seven card hand that can kill yourself on turn one. And it uses this card. So uh, <laughs> if you're interested in learning how to turn one kill, yourself go check out that video i'll probably put the link in the show notes um for you and with that jeff i think it's last call so are we ready for last our last beers of the evening yeah see i'm a, i'm prepared to use one with nothing on my beer oh so you're not gonna have a beer well i'm gonna drink it all right away oh i guess i'm not discarding you're gonna it discard it into your belly on the first sip so you're gonna chug it Oh shit! Is one with nothing just a chug? You just you just chug your hand, right? <laughs> chug your hand. <laughs> I guess that would be like using it all immediately for free, uh, which might be a little powerful. Yeah, and also fuck you up for a while. Yeah. All right, let's go to last call. Yeah. 
One, two, three, double. Double. Yeah, buddy. Mm, mm, mm. Knew it. Yeah. Not, not surprised. Not surprised. Yeah. I felt like I had you with this one. Uh, actually, as soon as I tasted yours. <laughs> really? Because it was... Yeah. I, I could kind of sense something when you were, you were talking about it earlier, but um, for me, it was when I tasted this one first. And then I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so our rating system, as always, is based on the tiers in Arena, which has nothing to do with what tier you're in right now. It's just a fun way to rate beer. However, bronze beers are trash. They're horrible. You don't want to finish them. You have to pour them down the drain, throw them in the trash, get them out of here. Totally. Silver beers are... You know, beers that don't have a ton going on, most macro brews would tend to fit into this category. Gold beers are fine, but you probably won't drink them again or ever think about them ever. Yeah. Platinum's the next step up from that. They're still kind of in the fine category, but they're like upper fine. You would totally have these again. Yeah, they're solid. Diamond beers are exceptional. You would recommend this to your friends. You will uh, show this off. You like this. And Mythic, these are the best of the best. Uh, you will buy these anytime you see them. You'd recommend these to anyone who will listen. You will go to a local bar because you know that they have this on tap. Yeah, okay. that's the big one. Uh, you will drive to the brewery just to pick up this beer. Right. All right. So, Jeff, with that, um, should we talk about double first? Or do you want to do the special Belgian ale? Uh, let's start with the double. Okay, all right. Yeah, maybe we can institute a new rule that if uh, if it's a unanimous decision, we start with the winner. I think that I like all the new rules that we're doing, and um, this is a great one. We're going to put that right in the bucket of good rules, good things, new structures. <laughs> um, double comes first. So I like this one. I don't know if it's, it's good. The, yeah, it's good. Um, the more alcohol... Uh, was what I was looking for. Uh, there's something with the malts, or I don't know what it is, but immediately I was like, oh, I like this a lot more than the last one I had. Uh, so totally. I knew right away. You know, this one's a little dangerous because uh, I was like halfway done while we were still talking about, you know, the first mechanic in Betrayers, and I had to be like, oh, wait, we're not, we're not even close here. I got to slow down. Mm -hmm. I got to re repace myself on this one, but... Uh, it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't taste, like you can taste the alcohol, so I, mm -hmm. I would be remiss to say that it doesn't taste strong, but it's not like those strong beers where all you can really taste is alcohol. It feels well balanced. It does, yeah. Um, and the balanced flavors, like normally in some of these beers, is like those malty things, which I'm already looking for, and I really like those. This is the beer style that I enjoy a lot. Um, so, yeah, this is it really fitting, hitting right in the middle. I really like where, it, where it's at. Um, this is a diamond beer for me. Um, I, I'm really happy with it. Would definitely recommend this to anybody. Yeah, I was going to put this in Diamond as well. Uh, the one thing I wanted to say is, like, if there are people out there who haven't had, you know, it sounds crazy, but haven't had a lot of, you know, Belgian-style strong beers, it's nothing really like your IPA, like your American style of strong beer, where the alcohol is ba balanced by hops. It's more like the alcohol is balanced by the natural uh, maltiness and fruitiness of the grains so it's not mm -hmm. if you think oh i don't like strong beers because what you've tried is an american ipa uh give a double or even uh, maybe we'll maybe a triple if you can find one of those a try um, because they're kind of a unique experience and the first time you have them you'll probably be like wow that went down super easy and then you know you'll have two of them in quick succession and realize that uh, they weren't lying when they put seven percent on it so yeah um, this is a great example of a belgian double in my eyes that's why i gave it diamond yeah um i think this is of the obviously i looking at their website and things i think this uh is kind of what they're known for and what they're what's 
really great about their their spots. So, um, yeah, happy with it. Diamonds all around. Let's move on to this special Belgian ale. Jeff, how special is yeah. this Belgian ale? I don't know what special means, uh, but I'll say it right now. I didn't like this. <laughs> uh, I think that may have been clear because you asked me like pretty early on how I felt. And I was like, ah, I'll let you know later. <laughs> um, it didn't get better for me, basically. I don't understand what it is, I guess. It felt like it didn't have that much flavor either. Like, because Belgian ales aren't really known for hops. It wasn't hoppy, which is fine, but it also didn't really have that malt character that I'm looking for. And so it almost tasted flat, but it obviously wasn't flat in the traditional sense. Like, I mean, f I don't mean it was undercarbonated. I mean, it like yeah. the flavors were flat. I totally see what you're saying. It didn't throw me off that much. And I was like, oh, this is kind of a nice, easy drinking ale that, uh, doesn't have the characteristics I don't like. It's closer to things I would like, but definitely wasn't, uh, it's not an amber or a red or anything that's, I'm, uh, you know, really voluptuous, I guess, in the flavor profile. It very, it's felt very, um, it's, hello, I'm here and, and you can just drink me. Um, so I did enjoy drinking it and I'm, I'm not, mad that i had it mm. but um <laughs> what are you gonna give this beer what's your rating i kind of want to give it silver <sighs> because it just had nothing like when i see nothing going on that's what this beer made me think like wow it's not crisp like a lager it doesn't have the flavor that i would hope for from you know brown amber ales it doesn't have any hops in it it just like had just had nothing. <laughs> okay. Wow. Uh, but I know like silver is is harsh in terms of like from their second beer, I know these guys are quality brewers. So it's just something that No, no, no. We're silver. not rating the brewery. We're rating the beer. Exactly. Yeah. So I think I just have to give this beer silver because for me this this has nothing going on. That is crazy. And that's right in our it's right in our description of that silver. That is crazy to me because I was like border platinum i was like all right this is probably platinum maybe gold but like after you said it was silver i don't know if it was i think you know what it was i think it was the font was pushing me up to platinum if they used a different font, font that wasn't it's close to font. the one that you made for our logo um i might yeah. be uh i might be uh bitter about it ah I still like this one. I'm probably just going to stick it in. I would drink this again, which is uh, platinum. I would drink this again, and I'm going to. And I'm... So I think part, part of the problem, too, is I was excited for this one. Like, of all the four we bought, I was like, ooh, special Belgian ale. I, like, yeah, okay. I kind of want to know what that is. Yeah, that's true. I was excited for it as well. And a triple and, and all that stuff. I was really excited to, uh, to drink it. Um, we have more. Uh, spoiler alert, we had to buy six of them. A lot more. <laughs> they would not sell them to us in singles. So I have a bunch. Um, but uh, I'm not... I'm looking forward to drinking more of them. I'm not looking away from it. I don't know. Whatever See, I think I'm just going to drink them throughout time. But, yeah. Uh, it's not necessarily something I'm... They may to. start my night and they may end yours, is what you're saying. All right, right, I get it. That's fine. Um, I'm good with that. Uh, great. So uh, this really... might be the biggest discrepancy of the a single brewery that I've rated: one diamond and one, one silver. silver. That's I've pretty ever, intense. I've ever gotten that kind of breadth out of a single brewery. Um, let's tell them. That's we'll, how I felt. We'll, we'll tweet them and tell them. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't do that. I was ready um, for them both to suck because I didn't like the first one. I was like, oh, here we go. We just bought a bunch of beers. A bunch of beer from this brewery. From this brewery. Yeah, well, you know. Um, all right. So with that being said, before we continue to closing time, I have one more question for you. If okay. both of these beers were a shock land, which <laughs> shock lands would they be? Okay. Good. That's a very apt question mm -hmm. an important one um see i kind of want to give the double the high esteem of being the hallowed fountain oh 
because it kind of has that aesthetic of hallowedness on the front already. You know, it okay. looks like these are, are religious driven monks who are dri- drinking this beer. I'm imagining they're getting it from their hallowed fountain at the monastery. Okay. Okay. The Belgian ale is, uh, see, this one's a little tougher. In terms of flavor, I kind of want to say overgrown tomb because that's where they got this from. <laughs> but that's also the, the best one. So it's hard to say. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so when you were talking about the high esteem of the double, I thought you were going to say it was steam vents. Um, ah. <laughs> but I think uh, hollowed fountain is good for that one. It really feels solid. Um, the, the special Belgian ale actually looks like stomping grounds to me. It really feels like, okay, I will drink whatever the fuck you put in my cup kind of place, you know, and I'm just going to throw yeah, it yeah. back. I can so, get behind that. Yeah. So it, it yeah. seems like, uh, stomping grounds is like the name of the bar where they have special Belgian ale on tap. You know what I mean? There you um, go. Yeah. Anyway, great. I'm really happy with that. Um, maybe we'll have to do that again in the future. But uh, anyway, for now, <laughs> it is closing time. Our rating system is getting even more complicated. It's getting so complicated. <laughs> which dual <laughs> land is this? <laughs> is this which fetch <laughs> land would you think? Which Eldrazi is this <laughs> vodka? You know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, you can always find us at Arena Regulars on Twitter and Instagram. You can also find us on MTG Arena under the username Arena Regulars Podcast. If you want to find me personally and talk about the decathlon or the Arena Cube or how Kamigawa is actually amazing in every single way and not just ninjutsu, you can find me at Zulberg on Twitter and Instagram. That's Z-E-U-L-B-E-R-G. But Jeff, where can they find you? can find me at blues brews mtg on twitter b-l-u-e-s-b-r-e-w-s-m-t-g and please leave us a review on apple podcasts and itunes follow us on spotify or any place that you're listening to us right now subscribe to our youtube channel leave a comment like a video say something funny about whatever we're doing uh we really appreciate the feedback and we love all the reviews you're giving us right now uh, it, it makes us feel really great and it gives us energy to do what we totally. do. So, and Hey, let us know if you like the new pseudo new format we got here where, uh, we drink beers at the same time instead of drinking opposite beers and getting confused about which one we drank. This has been the arena regulars reminding you to always block Satoru Umezawa. Good night. All right, that's fine.